So the story I want to talk about is essentially how I got to writing using the money view to write a book about something that's very outside the money view and the implications for that. And my book is frankly about a moment called the Cassini reforms, which is a moment in 1960s that I argue the in the 1960s that I argue the Soviet Union hit a particular instance of economic development where it had to, what we would say in the Chinese context now, rebalance, which means moving away from a economy that is led by investment and gains on increases in capital stock to an economy that is led by consumption and thus consumption led profits. So where all of this links into the money view kind of historically, right, in its way of thinking is in thinking about profits. And that's something that's key to where money view comes from, which is Minsky. Because Minsky is, in the end, the reader of a really interesting economist who's going to come up in this discussion named uh, named Mikhail Kaletsky. Uh, if you read through Minsky's work, it's just footnoted through with Kaletsky's logic, which is that all profit, which is that profits are the res all savings are results are profits of previous periods. And all profits are the results of consumption somewhere, right? Um, consumption can either be gained in two ways. One, you could have exp you could have it finally consumed by the consumer. Two, you could have increases in efficiency. The latter comes from improvements in capital stock. The so, Yakov, should we be seeing the slides move? Or are you still on one slide? No, not, not yet. All I'm right, just making sure. Moving in that slide. Uh, I, I, there's a method to my madness. So I'm going to kind uh, so I want to keep that in mind as we develop that, right? Because this is how money is driven through balance sheets. So where are we going? I'm going to start out with what I tell, kind of talk about where all this starts, which is the assumptions of the structures of a Stalinist economy, right? What does the planned economy of the Soviet Union, what is it supposed to do? What are the assumptions here? And the assumptions are pretty, are kind of fourfold. One is that all economic growth comes from the expansion of the means of production, right? That means that all growth is the result of technical progress and investment into high end of technology. The highest form of the organization of this kind of growth model is the vertically integrated capitalist factory of the late 19th, early 20th century. The fourth assumption is that war is inevitable under cap intercapitalist competition. And in the long run, capitalists cannot work together and the international system is unstable. Now, the addendum to that, which I, is that that is a driver of the move from capitalism to socialism. That's another assumption, right? The assumption is that the 1917 revolution, it didn't spread because this system stabilized but it was also the result of World War I and kind of intercapitalist competition that leads to World War I. So there is always going to be an inevitable second war coming that will then break the system and lead to the further revolutionary process. And fourth is that backwardness, which we are going to define as under-industrialization, is in and of itself a social threat because this is supposed to be a proletarian workers' regime. But if it's an agricultural economy dominated by small holders, there aren't enough proletarians to support the regime. So the answer to that, and I have a neat little Stalin quote in here, uh, is a planned industrialization. But the key to that industrialization is it needs to be financed, right? To finance that industrialization, you can do one of two things. One thing you can do, and this gets us starting to move towards understanding Kaletsky and then how you move into Minsky and instability dynamics. The first way to finance investment is you have to create savings. Now, savings, where do save, can savings come from? One form of savings you can come from is from the outside. So either foreign direct investment or shipping out uh, or, 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 or you can do it through save, creating increased savings in your own population, right? And that means lowering consumption. 
And ideally, that'll give you either a trade surplus, which can increase import, gives you a source of stock of to increase imports. And there's actually a dissertation I am uh, reading right now that is being written that actually is really interesting about that. Um, I didn't have it when I actually made this like a little stock presentation I always use, but um, it talks about how there is this attempt to, uh, and links to Kindleberger, there's this attempt to do that by exporting grain, by actually like decreasing the, uh, increasing grain collection, decreasing the amount Soviet peasants eat, which is why you get famines. And it actually doesn't work because the grain price falls as Kindleberger figures it out, but they get very lucky because then the gold price increases and thus the gulag, right? So that's the export base that you're not consuming. And it does lead to quite a bit of foreign technology import. But unlike, say, you know, the East Asian model, which we're really familiar with in this regard, the point isn't to use the use the new capital stock to export further. It is to minimize the interaction with the foreign economy. So I built this little structure when I wrote this book, and I actually modified this a couple of times, this little balance sheet that I had constantly running. Because balance sheets, once you put something onto a balance sheet, you can really see interactions. And what you're seeing is if we aggregate the state, right, it becomes kind of a jar, a large vacuum cleaner. It becomes something like a leveraged bank where the households are the depositors, but they're getting a negative interest rate to fund the, the enterprise. And that's good. That gives you a lot of growth initially, right? But that growth had, comes with a cliff because most of that growth as a percentage isn't being consumed. Most of the new investment is coming in to, and this again, kind of an old chart. I actually fixed this in the different, in the book, but I'm using a very old PowerPoint because I, this is like the most extensive one I have. And this is the one I practiced off of. <laughs> uh, most of this is actually, why is this set up this way? Sorry. My PowerPoint is not cooperating with me today. Um, nothing is cooperating with me today. Um, most of this is coming into producer goods rather than consumer goods. And initially, this leads to a lot of growth. This leads to almost 8% real GDP growth in, by the 50s, right? Because you're getting such technical improvements in efficiency. But what you're not getting eventually is a return on investment. And this is where we get to Kaletsky and Minsky and instability. In Kaletsky, there is a contradiction between, uh, between this short run need for investment and the long run need to verify the, to validate the investment through consumption. And that's a very difficult clip, cliff. Minsky in his book, John Maynard Keynes actually writes about this. He writes about how the reason you start getting inflationary inflation in the American economy, because he's writing about the American context, is because of it, and he explicitly says this, Mike Mikhail Kaletsky's model. Because what he says is happening in the United States in the late 1960s is there is a lot of gut, is there is financial instability in the banking system that we all know about from Perry's work, right? And from Perry's reading of Minsky, uh, especially with the 64 banking crisis. But that is offset with a wave of government investment. But that government investment isn't going into consumer industries. It is going into producer industries because of the up to up, up increase in the Vietnam War. And that is sucking labor force out of the consumer industries and increasing wages. So there are not enough consumer goods that are being produced to to take uh, to create the profits for wait uh, to create demand, I'm sorry, to create the supply needed by these higher wages especially because during Vietnam and there, there's really good work. My colleague, Tim Barker works on the procurements being done out of domestic industries rather than foreign industries like in the Korean war. And that given how large these and how labor intensive these, these that triggers the inflationary bump that begins to spiral and then is hit with the oil prop crisis. There's something systemically similar going on in the USSR, but on a grander scale right, in the macroeconomics, which is this is a permanent war economy. It is an economy designed to reproduce the means of production 
without those means of production being profitable. That leads to a problem. And the problem is, as we can kind of tell here, let me just find a better graph because I don't want to use it. That leads to, and I'm sorry, this PowerPoint is not a good one. Uh, I should not have used this one. There is, no, that's not. That leads by 1961 to what I call, I label a fiscal crisis because it becomes increasingly obvious that the return on investment is beginning to fall. And because of that, there are increasing shortages. Now to get to the politics of the matter, right? The argument in my book is that the reason this is a problem is because of the way the assumptions of the state change. Um, under Stalinism, there is this idea of an inevitable war. So none of this matters. This is a very militarized society. It's a very mobilized society. And the mobilization is kind of explicit and from the top down. Now, in the late 1950s, one of the assumptions of that begins to break down, and it sort of drives the system to a crisis point. And the, I'm sorry, the early 1950s. And that assumption is that capitalist states will always, war, will always be in tension against one another. The difference that comes in, and this is why I'm such a big fan of Kindleberger, is that the United States becomes something rather new in the world, which is the first modern hege hegemon. Right There is a reading, there's a distinction in the historiography between Kindleberger, who writes about hegemonic stability, and Eichengreen, who writes about how actually the 19th century is more about central bank coordination, and that's why the gold standard works. Now, in his work, Adam Tews, I think, very creatively points out that both of them are right. In the 19th century, the UK isn't playing the same kind of large-scale hegemonic role uh, of coordinating things as the United States is in the 50s, 60s. 60s, uh, but that what the U.S. is doing is actually rather new, and it does look more like kind of the Kindleberger story. This is a new system, and that I argue creates an existential problem in the assumption in the political assumptions of the Stalinist modernization model. So you kind of get a conflict from 1953 between Khrushchev and Malenkov. One, Malenkov, who actually, whose wife is a very talented economist, and my argument, I suspect she's actually the person who kind of influences them, is the idea of rebalancing, right? You have to rebalance now. You have to start moving away your investment base, away from your heavy industry, towards your light industry and agriculture, uh, and towards a diplomatic solution to the Cold War that might be not on Soviet terms in order to keep the economy from beginning to slow down. The other hand, you have Khrushchev, who is a true believer in the Stalinist model in some ways, but he believes that the problem with the Stalinist model was not the model, but Stalin himself, and that Stalin became a megalomaniac, and if only there were more honesty and less direct terror, this model would work, and you wouldn't have to change many things. And Khrushchev, and he also believes that, yes, there is a problem with the worldview that there will be an inevitable war, but that's not because these initial assumptions were wrong. It is because the Soviet Union now has global allies, and then the capitalist system isn't a dominant economic system anymore. It has a balance point. So for Khrushchev, his argument is we can solve all these problems just by sticking to our guns, increasing, keeping, in, increasing the economic power of the socialist world, and eventually, without much conflict, displacing the capitalist states as the global hegemon. And you know, this is this idea of peaceful competition that replaces the uh, the conflict, the inevitable war conflict, and the idea that you can catch up and overtake the United States and without much reform. And when you do that, you take become the world's largest economy, and things start, and inevitably, you begin to win. This inspires a lot of economists to begin to um, think about how they can use science, right, to do planning rather than much more ad hoc planning. And I document that process. Um, 
these two phenomena come together in the early 60s when you start having this fiscal crisis of the Soviet state that I argue about, this bout of really like closed inflation. There begins to be an open discussion about the problems of the economy. Um, this man here, Yevsey Lieberman, he uh, writes a, for, uh, a kind of front page argument uh, in Pravda about the necessity of incorporating profitability as an important aspect of planning because you need those balance sheets to come in. You need cash flows and that comes from profits. He even comes onto the cover of time eventually as this revolutionary thinker. And that in 1964 to 65, after Khrushchev is removed, as these prices gets worse, gets us to this moment of the Kasigian reforms, which is really what this book is about. And what I found fascinating, what I found really revelatory is how all of this comes together, because the way that these people who want to change the system to being more of a profit-led system to fixing the cash flow problem, the way they talk about this is it was a crisis in the Cold War and the Soviet project. They say that in order to not lag behind the capitalist world, the Soviet state needs to begin to embrace profitability as a criterion. That means embracing an interest rate, but most importantly, that means embracing consumption and embracing deinvestment out of these very over-invested in heavy industries and moving into producing more light industrial goods, more agricultural, uh, better agriculture, and generally becoming more dependent on the consumer sector to be the driver of the economy. The, the Kasigan reforms, and this is some just a little chart I made a couple um, to that I pulled from kind of an executive summary of just how bad the situation is starting to get, and the executive summary is explicitly designed to. Uh, by the Academy of Sciences, which is reporting this to the new leadership to say that essentially, whereas in the early to mid 50s, the Soviet economy is growing at six, seven percent, it is growing much faster than any competitive economy. It is now in a slowdown. So by 1965 to 1966, various groups are competing about what to do next in the economy. The ministries and the military industrial complex want to turn the clock back. They want to go before Khrushchev. They want to go before when Khrushchev does some reforms they cover in the book also, where he tries to decentralize planning a bit. They want to recentralize it in their hands. The state planning industries, they're interested in planning, making planning a little more rationalized uh, while still maintaining the priority of heavy industries and most importantly, their ability to form the plan. And then there is a third group that emerges, which are these academic economists who are empowered by this like crisis of the Cold War that want to do something really radical and really want to completely overhaul the planning system towards more various forms of more marketized relations, which increase the uh, salience of profitability. There is a law called the Kasigan Reform. It is a consensus law. I go through that law. It attempts to, through the 60s, the late 60s, increase the salience of profitability, create prices that are more scarcity-based in order to kind of get profits to mean something. And functionally, it is slowly but surely overturned by Brezhnev. And the reason is that the laws cannot do the last thing, which is to either build in scarcity-based prices or force the reinvestment of new surplus into the consumer goods industries at a rate sufficient enough that it solves the disequilibrium in the economy. That means that problems on ROI, uh, ROI, which have been plaguing the economy since the mid 60s are minimized a bit, but they are just moved back through, through this channel of bonuses that the law enables. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details because I don't have much more time, but what we wind up having is a kind of by the 70s, a foreclosure of the reform with a more conservative period, one in which some of the micro kind of innovation of the reform, like introducing benefits for better uh, production through wage boosts essentially are kept a bit, but the larger ambitions of reform overhauling the whole planning system are put on hold. Um, 
And instead, the new line, the new kind of party line of solving these problems is to re-increase the rate of investment and hope that it brings some kind of um, some kind of boost through scientific innovation so you can get more productivity so you don't have to have a reform anymore right you've just simply uh product uh you've just simply used more innovation to solve the problem which is a macroeconomic problem um i'm going to skip these because these aren't that interesting what i think is really what i do want to get to is kind of how all of this ends right so in the 1980s you have another bout of reform but this reform isn't really the same as its predecessors during the Kasigan era. This reform is actually, I argue, what becomes Perestroika is a moment in which, excuse me, the new generation reformers have kind of taken aboard the ideological load of this Brezhnev era science uh, and uh, productivity increase discourse. And they are they are wondering why the more breakthrough industries aren't getting their share of investment. They're no longer really interested. They're not really that interested, at least initially, in moving the rebalancing the economy. Um, and their argument initially comes out to this idea that, well, it's actually the politics. It's the cadres, is these like old cadres that are keeping us from really putting in investment into these high tech industries. So we need to both get, have a political revolution of getting rid of these old generations of cadres and actually pump money into new industries. And that act, that that that's really interesting and that's problematic because what it does is it actually makes the problem slightly worse because again, you're not getting enough consumption to validate the profits of these new industries. Not only that, you know, you've gotten rid of the kind of administrative means in which this always disbalanced economy is governed. So what used to be hidden inflation becomes open inflation. And open inflate and that open inflation, so I highlight these two kind of items on this uh, little graph I made uh, this little table here. What's really interesting is a lot of this open inflation is coming from practices like, for example, small business, legalization of small business, or they call it cooperatives, that they've enabled to break the old elite that is now uncapturable in the old fiscal system. And that fiscal system, that breaking of the old fiscal system by the late 1980s is where we get the reintroduction of market practices and more importantly, people starting to experiment with market governance, and thus the end of a Soviet-style economy and this intermediate, intermittent period between 1987 and 1993, where you really have the new Russian constitution, for example, coming in, and super-presidentialism being codified as a as a governance system in order to force through market in order to force through market government over what is already frankly a free market economy already in the late 1980s so that's my little summary of my book project and where it is uh it is done and it comes out in june and if you want to re learn more and have prettier graphs that were made by a actual graphic designer using my spreadsheets please buy the book Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Yakov. Um, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that I am not super familiar with um, Soviet economics. Um, so I'm looking forward to having your book be my window, right? That's going to be my starting point. Um, and we may even uh, read your book in the Money View Reading Group this summer. It'll definitely be um, something I'm interested in. Um, so we can open it up to questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand or post them in the chat. Um, we start a little bit late. Uh, so I think um, I will, I'll say we can go to 215 if people have to duck out sooner than that. Are you able to stay a little bit for questions, Yakov? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand um, or post it in the chat. It looks like uh, Chris Rimmer has a, has a comment in the chat. Do you want to speak to that, Chris? 
Um, yeah, sure. Uh, there was, um, I just remember hearing about, I haven't read it, a book by uh, Mises in the 1920s, or I think it was an article. Um, I was just trying to find it. Uh, there's one called Economic Calculation in the Socialist uh, yeah, Commonwealth. Yeah. That's a huge kind of the, the socialist calculation debate, right? Is whether a socialist state can form prices, right, um, without a mark without markets. And actually, like Mises, kind of loses that debate. And I don't think he's right in that debate, frankly, either, because it's not about the problem. Doesn't come about because of like, in fact, person who a lot of Soviet market reformers are inspired by winds up kind of taking it, which is Oscar Lange. Right, who is the kind of father of neoclassical economics as we know it, who was also an ardent communist and actually runs the planning bureau for a while in communist Poland. And he basically argues that if you have enough information, right, if you have deep enough, uh, you can calculate prices in core sectors that then through some markets, allowable markets in a social estate will allow you to have, you know, a grip over the price system. And the time he seems to have won, actually. Most people think he gets the drop. What I think is more interesting is the reason he wins, I think, is both of them are obsessed with prices, where the thing Kaletsky, a fellow actually Polish communist who doesn't like Lange very much and thinks is more of a kind of libertarian, let's say, socialist at heart, I think, says, well, the problem isn't prices. The problem is who sets the priority of investment, Right because prices are downstream of capital formation. of uh, And you can have different price equilibria given different scenarios of the previous period's capital stock. And the previous period's capital stock is always the function of the previous period before that rate uh, investment decisions. So in a capitalist system that leads to you know financial instability, in a socialist system, if there isn't a, you know, if there isn't a feedback loop, if there isn't which he suggests would come from more democracy or more uh or more market signals, then there isn't a then it's not the price that creates a disequilibrium, it's the previous previous period's priorities. And that neither system, in his opinion, is actually a stable system without a bit of each. And that's actually the connection to the money view is through. Jaime Minsky, who takes that and draws out the balance sheet and financial instability implications of Kletsky's views in the capitalist system. Because prices become irrational over time through Minsky's kind of instability hypothesis. That's interesting. I actually haven't haven't really read Kletsky. Um, and the connection from him to Minsky is um, uh, maybe something I should... I should pay some attention to. Let's go to, let's do it in order. Let's go to Karen. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a little bit of a different reading from your set, what you were saying about consumption. Wasn't the problem of the Soviet Union, I'm talking Stalinist days, that, uh, that agriculture was uh, suppressed by being uh, impounded? I mean, the whole a lot of more uh, history was really killing the peasants uh, and uh, in that sense, killing production. So that in order to, to get workers to work in the factories and get, get the uh, uh, necessary uh, uh, nutrition for them, they simply impounded that from, from, from the Ukrainian Etc. Peasants and thereby, and thereby they killed off a lot of and That's also killed true. off a lot of the peasants. And so I would say that if agriculture had been able to develop, I mean, then you had a better workforce. It's not as if I mean I don't see it as if these the workers are necessary as consumers. I see it as if they're necessary as being able to work. Uh, and that's I a different perspective. Totally agree there for two reasons. One is actually workers' household consumptions fell dramatically under Stalinism. Relative. Yes, of course, because there was no... I mean, there, there because was no there was no... Because there was no... And I agree, because there was no production. Yeah, right. But the the whole thing... But you did that in order to form the capital... Uh, the savings base for investment, right? The point is the system works, you know, for takeoff growth for Gershon Cronian growth, 
but I don't think, but in the long run, once you've caught up to like in, in the book, I actually use the language of the middle income trap of the Soviet Union's history's largest middle income trap, right? Because once you reach a certain a certain rate of uh once you reach a certain development of your cap capital stock, you're not getting any more productivity efficiencies without shifting, without doing, you know, what China is trying to do right now, probably ineffectively, without shifting your uh more of your production into meeting domestic uh, domestic needs for consumption or importing one of the two because you need profits from somewhere. And yes, like what the Stalinist system did was it cut consumption by cutting off production mm -hmm. and attempting to ship that production elsewhere and actually failing at that as we now know from kind of re very recent historical research in literally the last four years. Uh, but getting very lucky in that it also had large reserves of minerals uh, that made up for that failure of trying to suppress grain production as consumption essentially and getting it shipped out because the price of grain on the international market happened to collapse at the same time. Thank you. All right, let's go to Jay. There you go. Can you see me? Hear me? Yeah, you're good. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Yakov. Really great to hear this presentation and see the book come out soon. Um, I can't help to notice the, the analogies to Michael Pettis' arguments about China, um, especially um, rebalancing and also the fact that once you're in an investment regime, it's very difficult to transition into a more consumption, uh, consumptionist regime. Uh, how would you say would that analogy work within the Soviet context? Would it have been possible to switch modes in the 1950s under Khrushchev? Into... Yeah, I think if you're going to do it, that's when you wanted to. And how difficult is it, to, 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 in your view, um, how, yeah, how, how difficult is it to, to transition from such a mode into another mode? Um, yeah, I'm just curious how that how that plays out in, in a Soviet context. Yeah, well, this is, you know, Mike Pettis is trying to tra get my manuscript translated into Chinese for a reason. He's actually one of my blurbs on the back. And the reason is he's like, well, what you're writing about, and this is true, and I say it explicitly, is actually China. And this is a way of critici critici criticizing Xi without, you know, using the word Xi Jinping and actually is they, they really his he and his friends really like this thing because it's saying, well, you've completely misread the Soviet experience that you're so terrified about. Uh is that like in fact you're actually making things worse and you're doing exactly the thing Brezhnev and his friends did, which is try to literally invest into AI in order to solve a macroeconomic disbalance. And in the book, because I kind of want to point to the economics of the book rather than the politics in this presentation, which is why I skipped a lot of the slides, frankly. Um, I do get into this idea of Leninism as a particular kind of governance that a political philosopher named um, Ken Jowett um, writes about, that it is this innovative form of political organization that's very good for taking largely agricultural societies and bringing them in to industrial societies, but doesn't really know what to do next. And then you wind up with systemic corruption because the party no longer has a kind of fighting task. And I think there's a lot to that um, as a like theory of a the party state, which is a new thing in the 20th century that is, I think, invented in the Soviet Union. There really isn't a party idea of a party state before that. And I do think party states have a unique problem in this because they are, at their outset, I think, designed to industrialize and to modernize. They're not very good, I think, in moving to the next stage. Now, I'm not sure what is very good at moving to this next stage because historically, most countries haven't been able to do that very easily without a lot of stop and go and without a lot of recessions. Um, and, you know, if you look at American history, European history, or histories of successful, you know, large scale industrial economies, 
they have been dominated in the late 19th and early 20th century by the phenomenon of large-scale unemployment, large-scale recession. Um, the 19th century is a terrible time. Uh, and to, that is getting and working up the kinks out of this process of industrialization. So I'm not sure any state is a good model for doing this smoothly, but there are unique problems of these being done in party states where this isn't being kind of moved through a recessionary mechanism that explicit that's explicit by the but the stagnationary mechanism that is part of politics. Okay, let's go to Perry. Go ahead, Perry. Um, yeah, so um, I was intrigued by what you said very early on in your talk. You were making a little analogy between what was happening in the U.S. economy under the distortion of production, productive structure under the Vietnam War and the war, the permanent war economy of the Soviet Union. Um, the, the argument you were making was that for the United States, this distortion showed up as inflation because you have the, the workers who are making we're making war material, you know, are competing for the same consumer goods as the work as the workers who are making consumer goods. And so they're driving up those prices, um, if I yes. heard you correctly. Yes. Yes. Um, this is a Kletsky argument in that theories of growth in different social systems. This is actually out of uh, this is actually Binsky's interpretation of Kletsky's and John Maynard Keynes. In John Maynard Keynes. So. Uh, you probably didn't hear my keynote on Friday, okay, where I'm trying to work on the fourth price of money, okay? And the idea is that what when you get inflation, it's because you're you're stocking out. <laughs> um, that inventory, there's an inventory constraint. Inventories have to be greater than zero. Um, and when you stock out, then you're basically in a seller's market, okay? And so you, that's when prices get unmoored. Um, now you're telling a story about this as being a sec. So this is sectoral, you know, yes. that it's consumption goods prices that are unmoored. Okay. Uh, that, that, that this is the point that different parts of the economy can, can, can be, you know, inventories can be stocked out in one area, but not stocked out in other areas. And so you get price distortions, um, relative price distortions that come from that, which then, you know, play in because, so the story I'm trying to work on about 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 inflation as an ongoing process is that real wages, you know, are come from a different place. They come from bargaining. And so if if the consumer prices go up, then the nominal wage has to go up too, you know. And so then you start to to get into trouble. Um so I'm just making some links here, maybe more for my own sake than for your sake. <laughs> Um, and and seeing if we're on the same page a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I mean, we're definitely on the same page. And I think this is why I don't love the kind of Hayek Mises information approach to price formation. I think it's too general. Like, I think prices are downstream of capital structure and capital structure is downstream of decisions to make investments by planners or capitalists. And those decisions aren't made from good information. They're made from information that in one way or another compounds dis, uh, compounds information disequilibria, right? If you go to one extreme or to another. And to me, that's just read, that is the financial instability hypothesis and how, right? Well, I was applying a dealer model to commodities, okay? Yep. And saying that there's an outside spread where it's the producers, it's the producers ask and the consumers bid, which are the outside spread. I, I mean, and I it's think the producers actually, ask that then gets hit. I and think that's, so, abso uh, that's absolutely right. Okay. But okay. where Good. where did the producers ask come from? It comes from the ability in commodities markets. I think it's a really explicit one. It comes from the ability of the producer to produce the commodity. Yeah. So it's capacity constraints. It's the capacity, right? And where yeah, is the yeah. capacity constraint that is downstream of a decision to invest money in the previous period, yeah. which is, uh, just links back to the money dealer market. And and if and if the government is basically preventing you from from ramping up because it's trying to do something else, you know, then you don't get you don't get the the ramped up production. Um, and so you stay there for a little while. 
All right. Exactly. So Unless we'll have a longer break. conversation about yeah. this. I'm going to. We've exchanged this over emails with like. All yeah, the yeah, yeah. I'm just putting it together. In my mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Right. And like the question is, OK, where is the politi politics? Right. Why is the government making one priority over the other? And to me, I think that has to do with an understanding of ideology. Okay. Right. And the way that the Soviet state is interpreting the world that it lives in. Because it, but in the Soviet state, it doesn't sh does it show up as inflation or it's it shortage. because they have control of prices, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so it shows it does actually it shows show up, up as shortages, prices. shortages and lines yeah, and things. But like it that. does show up in some prices as yeah, inflation. Yeah, yeah. It shows up in the uncontrolled prices. So actually, agricultural markets aren't as price controlled as other markets. Yeah. So you see that in agricultural goods, um, but you also see it in. A chart uh, in a graph I forgot to put in uh, that I made for the book, which is the return, uh, the falling return on investment on capital goods. Mm -hmm. So for every ruble that they're investing after nineteen about fifty eight into new capital stock, they're actually only getting fifty eight cents initially, fifty eight uh, kopecks back in increased production. Whereas before this fifty eight breaking point, they're actually getting a positive return on investment because the capital stock is still fairly low been damaged by war often and the return on investment of new capital stock due to higher productivity is what winds up kind of still giving you econ forward economic growth because you are increasing capacity up to a certain point even if it's not well targeted there's enough of an increasing capacity where the nominal the household even is nominally seeing increases in uh in in consumption even though it's real increase is starting to go down and it's in the late fifties, early sixties where the two begin to actually be felt. Thank you. Okay. Let's go really quick. Uh, last question. Shung Bei, go ahead. Oh, oh, thank you for the great talk. I really enjoyed your discussion about Kaleski and uh, just uh, before uh, I actually use the uh, Kaleski levy property equation to kind of uh, explain the unique growth model China enjoyed, in fact, uh, quite successful for some time, and also uh, how that can uh, going uh, kind of going down already. Uh, but uh, but back to the question about Soviet uh, st failure of the economic system. Of course, after Soviet Union collapsed and uh, Russia, of course, took over, it changes the economic system. It's more of a capitalist system. In fact, for many years, enjoyed relatively friendly connection with European, even to American, uh, like business people. But despite that, right, despite the, uh, the, what they can learn from the past uh, failures and despite the relatively strong connection with, with the West, uh, the Russian economy is nowhere near a success story. So I'm just wondering, uh, how do you see that uh, from the, like, have you thought about the reason for that? I mean, yes, this is a bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. And like what I wanted to do is like a 15 minute discussion that it kind of focuses in on a very particular point. But I do see, I think that, and I think, as I've said, the broader story of the book isn't an economic one. It's a historical and a political one. I think the reason for that is that, frankly, especially in the Russian economy, there was never a political settlement over how law and particularly economic law is made. Um, and to me, the breaking point of that is actually not 1991, but 1993, uh, which is a crisis, which most people don't really remember, but there is a crisis between an elected parliament that's still elected actually in the, under the Soviet period in 1988, which is actually a relatively free election and the presidency, which is the Yeltsin presidency, right, which is elected after 1991, really appointed after 1991. And constitutionally, neither of them, it's not really clear which of them is supposed to have which power in lawmaking. And it comes to a head when it comes to property right reforms, right, under and really becomes part of entangled with the appointment of Gaidar as prime minister. And each of them claim to have the constitutional right to make these decisions, 
in the end, it's a claim that's resolved by force, right? The army steps in and it backs the presidency, and there is a new constitutional referendum that gives a lot of power to the presidency, more than you can imagine, really. Like then, and very little to the parliament, the Duma, uh, as it's now called, or the courts. And that comes into clarifying the relationship between who gets to make economic decisions over this vast capital stocks is depreciating very quickly. Uh, and that decision, which is backed up at the time by many liberals because they're very nervous about the large Communist Party presence in this parliament because the elections were relatively free but not super free in their argument that had brought it into power in 1989, they back the Yeltsin and the presidency. And there's not much other than term limits that's changed to give Putin the power he has now. Um, not much in that constitution has changed, as we think, other than the removal of term limits, really. Um, and I think it's that plus other factors that are unique, the fact of this super presidential system that isn't very, very not sure how to transition power from one individual to another without breakdowns that we have what we have now. In terms of Russian sheer economic Russian performance, I mean, the issue is that, you know, Russia had to write down a lot of capital stock over two decades. And it really couldn't do that until 1998, uh, when it finally super devalued its currency, because that was the only way out. Um, and then it got very lucky with high prices on commodities and it, there wasn't hasn't really been much else going on there's been a write down of capital stock but there's not been a lot of reinvestment in capital stock outside of the very profitable industries which in russia are, are the low hanging fruit is the commodities industries um and it's a really good question as to where you can get profit out of the Russian economy outside the commodities industries because you don't have a population surplus like you had in China or a standard developing country, right? Um, and I just got disconnected. You're not disconnected. You're just not oh, sharing not. anymore. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, I don't know. It's a really, it's a very difficult question on how to transition this kind of economy in like where the profit making sectors are if you're advising a russian government out in the 2000s right um because again where is the foreign surplus come uh, for an fx uh, can, how do you break the fx constraint well that's a very difficult problem because you don't have competitive exports and you don't have cheap labor so well and guess exactly that's not great for your development in the long run for various reasons. Okay. Um, well, I think that is, I think that'll do it. That, that brings us to, uh, to an end here. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Yakov, and discussing your book. Thank you. Thank you.